Hi, I'm Leonard Marcus, and I'm here at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., at an exhibition that has just opened called Building Stories, about the idea of home and finding your place in the world through children's books. And I happen to be the curator of this show, and I am standing next to Eileen Fuchs, who is the president and head of the National Building Museum. And we're going to talk about this exhibit. Eileen, so good to see you. So good to be here and to be chatting with you about our favorite new exhibition. So tell me about it. Why did a museum about buildings and the built environment want a show about children's books? Well, our mission is to inspire curiosity about the world we design and build, right? It's, it's all about the world we design and build. So what could be a better porthole, a better kind of way to, to engage our diverse audiences to think about the world we design and build than children's literature? Children's, you know, the, the, the idea of using your imagination to create stories to me is that also the same imagination you have to tap into to design a building, to build a community. So we're, we're really excited about it. We think it hits all of our pillars that are important to us. And it turns out building a building and making a book have a lot in common, don't they? Now that we're in the exhibition, it's such a, an obvious tie, but I think it's a new lens that our audience is really going to get excited about. Talk a little bit about who the audience for this show is. Is it only for children, or what is it, would you say? We never really outgrow our, our favorite books, right? Um, and so on the one hand, the core curriculum that we're, we've developed is for, for a K through three audience. But this truly is a show that you could come on with your mother, you could come on a date. I mean, it's, it, it stirs up this nostalgia in you and just the scholarship is, is really, really so strong. It's, I think it's, it, it applies to, to so many people. We don't often even try to do something for everyone, but this really is something for everyone. The whole kind of goal of the museum is to look around your built world and to think about how you interact with it and how it how it impacts you and why it matters, you know. And so that that sense that we're starting with our youngest visitors to think about what's most pressing to them, which is often their home, and to kind of expand upon their world from there makes makes so much sense. And it just feels like it's just this wonderful entree into like what we want people as lifelong learners to be thinking about with their engagement with the built environment. And in this gallery, which is the fourth and last gallery of the show, we're standing in front of a backdrop created by Oliver Jeffers, the picture book artist, and this gallery is devoted to thinking about the planet as our home. Uh, not just the four walls and the roof that we live in, but the planet itself. And how is that a, a theme that the National Building Museum is interested in in general? It's a global world. We all have to work together on the most pressing design and build needs of our time, which are which are climate and public health and equity. And, and so I think it's, um, it's really a, a beautiful, appropriate sentiment to be thinking about, about the planet in that way. I'm really excited about what we're going to bring to our local communities, but I think that this has far, far reach. Let's go see what's inside. We're in the first gallery of building stories, and it's all about how children are introduced to the world of making things and also the world of storytelling. So we have two of the oldest educational toys in history in this gallery, uh, building blocks and alphabet blocks and alphabet books. Because alphabets are the beginning of all storytelling, and building blocks are the beginning of thinking about the physical environment and the homes of our dreams. I think of books as the homes that stories dwell in, and some books are three-dimensional objects. They're constructed almost like miniature houses. Pop-up books are a good example of that, and we have a number of the most creative examples of books of that kind here. Oh, Roxy, well, fancy meeting you here. Uh, and here's one of your books, uh, an alphabet book set in the city. Why don't you tell us about making this book? I see we have some sketches of yours as well as the uh, finished book itself. So this book involves gamification, which is a way to teach children different things. For example, there's a counting finding game in this with vocabulary, but also... It's a maze, and it goes from page to page. So you would think, because of the way pages turn, that it would be a long, skinny city. But actually, in four or five places, I managed to work it out very carefully where the streets match up, and it becomes a more rectangular shape. I love architecture, and I love ABC books. I often think when I'm flying in an airplane, 
that when you look down and you see the city and you see the countryside, you can almost imagine yourself just walking along that winding road or walking between those big buildings. So it does give you a sense of place in a different way than if you're really down there and enveloped in it. What do you want children to take away from this alphabet book? You know, kids are so kind of, in a way, uncuratorial in the sense that they are just fascinated by everything. So I want them to see that their city, and I think that children feel this way, it isn't necessarily ugly or unattractive or badly bad architecture. It's just endlessly interesting and fascinating. Okay, thanks, Roxy. It was really good talking with you. See you later. We're going through arches that are meant to remind you of the three little pigs. One of the arches is made of pictures of straw, one is of sticks, and the third one is of bricks. And we all know which house stood up to the wolf and which ones didn't. <laughs> Reminder that not all houses are the same. Moving into the second gallery, and this one is about what houses, the places where people live, are like all around the world. And also about people who don't have houses, or people who have had to leave their houses as refugees, or because of a storm, or for some other reason. This book is by an artist from Syria, and the pictures are made out of stones. He's put stones together to make images of people, and these people have been um, victims of warfare, and they've had to leave the homes that they call their own and go searching for a new place to live. We think of stones as permanent, unbreakable, and but these people are in exactly the opposite kind of situation. Um, they no longer have a permanent home. So the artist is trying to make a statement of hope for these people that they'll eventually find a home that, that can be permanent for them too. This long vertical book um, is the story of a Mexican migrant moving north from Mexico into the U.S., hoping to find a better life for himself and his family. Over here, we have three books from China. The one on top is a comic strip, the most popular comic strip in the 20th century in China, about a little boy uh, nicknamed Three Hairs, because he has three hairs sticking up from his head, and he doesn't have a home. He lives in the streets, and he has to be a trickster, a very clever fellow, trying to figure out how to always have his next meal. And so each story, which is wordless, uh, designed for people, even people who didn't know uh, how to read, um, his stories are all about finding some clever way to get people to help him um, have enough money to have his next meal. Juxtaposed with that is a picture book by the Chinese-American picture book artist um, Ed Young, who grew up in China in exactly the same time as those comic strips were being made, the 1930s. And Ed Young's family were much better off than Three Harris was. His father was an engineer who had studied uh, in America, and he designed a very modern, fancy, beautiful house, even with a swimming pool in Shanghai in the 1930s, which is where Ed, the artist, grew up before um, war came to China, and Ed and his family had to flee to America, where he lived ever since. The bottom book is called New Year's Reunion, and it's only about 10 years old, and it was the first picture book published in China that was translated into English and came to America and to England uh, as a book imported from China. And it's the story of the 200 million um, Chinese workers who every year leave home for most of the year to some remote place far from home within China where there's work for them to do. They save up their money and then on New Year's week they come back home and have a reunion with their family. So it's a very touching story about people who are struggling to make ends meet. Um, but it's also a family story and it's a glimpse of what uh, life in contemporary China is really like. So this gallery is all about the fact that children are not as big as their parents and that they find themselves in a world where the doorknobs are often too high to reach and shelves are way too high. And so scale, the relationship of our size 
to the size of everything that's been built around us can be problematic or the source of fantasy or have all sorts of meanings for us that sometimes become the subjects of stories. We're going to go look at a part of this gallery about scale, which was designed by David Macaulay, whose books about buildings like Pyramid and Cathedral you may know. So let's go have a look. Well, David, how nice to see you here. David Macaulay. Yeah. So David, here we are at the National Building Museum and in the part of the exhibition building stories that you designed. Um, tell us what you had in mind when you, when you did all this. I decided to explain the construction of a book mm -hmm. and the stuff inside it. And I chose a particularly difficult book for me. Uh, uh, not in the end, but the process was so convoluted. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason there's so much stuff on the wall here is that I had no idea what I was doing. So I was drawing all the time, sketching. As I, and when I'm sketching, I'm hoping that something will come up. Uh -huh. some, some idea will present itself, uh -huh. and that will put me on a path somewhere. It didn't for a long time. There was no path. Uh -huh. There was just stuff, detritus. It turns out that it was the ideal material with which to show one example of the creative process okay. when it comes to making a book. And the book you chose? It was a book called Romantics, uh -huh. which is a, basically a book about Rome. Mm -hmm. Rome is a place I love, and that made the process that much more difficult because Something you really love, you want to get it right. Mm -hmm. And you're not necessarily sure what that, what that means, mm -hmm. to get it right. Mm -hmm. um, so I tried all these different things, and on these two walls, this one and that one, um, are the experiments in a way, the introduction of characters mm -hmm. to serve as tour guides, taking you through my favorite city in the world. I chose a pigeon as my tour guide. Mm -hmm. I got rid of all those characters, chose a pigeon. That meant I could show things from all kinds of different points of bird's view. Eye, bird's, bird's eye view. And birds on the ground, birds mm -hmm. flying over, uh -huh. and I, they gave me the freedom I needed. So even though they're kind of traditional looking drawings, lots of cross hatching mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff, the points of view and the mm -hmm. perspectives are yeah. totally wacky in yeah. some cases. Yeah. But that's all part of the, of the journey. These are clouds of doubt. <laughs> and, they, and they do not, these are the questions you ask yourself, like, uh -huh. why am I doing this book? Who's this for, anyway? Do we need another book about Rome? Does the world, is it going to be a better place with yet another book about Rome? But the, and the, these are the things that sort of kind of filter through your brain while you're working, and you know you haven't figured out yet mm -hmm. why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. At this point, what we're talking about, I've chosen the 48 drawings that I want on each page uh -huh. in the sequence of the, of the journey. Uh -huh. And now I just have to take each of those sketches one by one and kind of get them ready to become finished mm -hmm. illustrations. Yeah. And I just decided if I just showed one drawing big, uh -huh. yeah. you would get a sense of the scale, uh, 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 not only the, the scale of the line work, the number of lines. I mean, yeah, I'm showing off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of lines here. <laughs> and some people are impressed by lots of lines. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe it'll work. Uh, but then this becomes the example. We then take this drawing and we tilt it, as you can see over here with the cherubs, huh. delivering it to its place in the grid oh. that is basically the entire finished book. Oh. But now there's text. Uh -huh. And there's also another edition. It was very last minute. Um, the red line, you, you could see it here. Mm. The red line is the journey of the pigeon. The pigeon swoops in hits the video camera, you know, the surveillance camera, huh. lands on the cobblestones, lands on the sign, jumps up and over this, and jumps around and hops through another, you know, arch and so on and so forth. This is the journey that the pigeon was making. Now this, the thing about this pigeon is it had to have a reason for existing. This is my tour guide. And I decided that it would be delivering a message. So it's a homing pigeon, oh, basically. Uh -huh. But it's an, it, it, like, the, like the author of this book, it's an incredibly inefficient homing pigeon. It has no concern for, for straight lines. And, to identify with the pigeon. Right, exactly. <laughs> Total, you know, short, short distances between two points, that sort of thing never occurs to the pigeon. Mm -hmm. uh, take the long circuit, the tourist route, basically. See things that you're curious about, and that, of course, allowed me the freedom to make the drawings from different points of view. If you see the red line, you can, see, you can see the trail of the pigeon. If you don't see the red line, like in this one, you are the pigeon. So from chaos over there to order over here, that's how this book was built. I think this part of the exhibit is 
is in a way the heart of the show because it, it shows everyone who comes to see the show how all these books which are on exhibit uh, were not just done in a day. Yeah. Like Rome wasn't built in a no, day either, was it? Exactly. No, um, no, but that there were so many options that could or could not have been pursued. Right. And I mean, you, you wrote uh, The Way Things Work and you've just told us the way things work, the way things don't work, the way things may or may not work. Yep. And it's all part of the same process, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah, it is. So now we're gonna walk into the fourth and final gallery of the exhibition Building Stories. And this is the one where we think of the planet Earth as our home. We're now not just talking about a house with a roof or even a community, but the planet itself. So let's have a look. And the picture book artist of our time who thinks about this way of looking at home most is Oliver Jeffers. So we have this beautiful mural that he painted for the exhibition uh, as a backdrop. And here in the gallery are all kinds of picture books that are about um, actually making things and making the world a better place working in a community garden, planting flowers in the city, things like that. So we hope that children and their parents and everyone else will uh, begin to think of themselves not just as readers, but also as makers of the world into a better place for the future. We have big, soft building blocks that you can uh, actually build with, being viewers and uh, learners about things to being makers of things in the final gallery. Thank you for joining me at the exhibition Building Stories.